Week one of Donald Trump and how his trade policies could affect Ohio. Joining us on Columbus on the Record this week, Ann Fisher, host of All Sides with Ann Fisher on 89.7 NPR News. Mark Niquette, reporter for Bloomberg News. Dale Butlin, Democratic strategist. And Mark Weaver, Republican strategist. To no one's surprise, the first week of the Trump administration has been a memorable one. Several of his early and promised policy decisions will affect central Ohioans. First to immigration, he signed an order to continue building the wall between the U.S. and Mexico. And he vowed to step up deportations as well as crack down and enforce immigration laws in cities. Day one, I've said it, and I mean the immediate removal of criminal aliens. They're going to be gone fast. And finally, at long last, cracking down on sanctuary cities. Sanctuary cities are those which refuse to turn over undocumented immigrants to immigration officials. Oberlin is the only official one in Ohio. Columbus officials have resisted calls for Columbus to become a sanctuary city. Mark Niquette, these are what he promised during the campaign, yet people seem surprised that he's trying to enact them either through executive order or legislation. Right, and, and the big question is going to be how do they actually get enforced? You know, when it comes to sanctuary cities, you know, the idea is that the federal government, the Trump administration, is going to somehow deny funding, federal funding, to these sanctuary cities, but there's some problems with that. One, it's, it's not entirely clear what qualifies as a sanctuary city. Some cities, like Oberlin, have taken official action. Others just have sort of policies where they don't allow, say, the police to turn over uh, 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 undocumented immigrants if they come across them in an investigation, that kind of thing. And there's some question about how much the federal government can actually, you know, pull back money that's already earmarked for state and local governments. Um, if there's some kind of policy that's part of the funding, they could pull it back if the policy is not being followed, but just to unilaterally say, hey, we're not giving you this money because you're not following the sanctuary city guidelines we'd like. I mean, these, these sanctuary cities are very, as you said, they're very fuzzy. Yeah, there are some cities that have taken a stand, San Francisco, I think Austin, Texas, Oberlin. But otherwise, it's don't ask, don't tell, right, for the most part? Well, I'm trying to figure out how they would know. It's like the tree falling in the woods. If they don't report something, how do they know they didn't report something? Where is it going to be documented? Well, there's an interesting analogy here. We're in, we're in Columbus, the home of Ohio State University. Colleges all around the country are scared to death of losing federal funds if they do one thing that violates Title IX. And as a result, they're constantly putting in compliance measures. There ought to be the same standard for any city that doesn't follow other federal laws, and that is you don't have to adopt a policy saying you're in violation. If the feds identify you as in violation, you can lose your federal funds the way you could under Title IX. Except that there's an interesting, delicious irony here, and that is that Donald Trump may soon find that his war on sanctuary cities uh, is being blocked by two of the Republicans' favorite things. One is the Tenth Amendment, and the other is the ghost of uh, what Trump says is his favorite S Supreme Court justice, the late Scalia, Justice Scalia. Because in two cases, one in 1997 dealing with gun control and another in 2012 dealing with Medicaid expansion under the ACA, Scalia wrote and the majority found that the feds cannot commandeer the cooperation of state governments in enforcing federal law. Uh, they went on to say that you can't withhold money from states or localities that, that don't do that because that amounts to holding a gun to their heads, forcing them to choose between funding and following federal law. So that would be the irony of all ironies if Justice Scalia came back from the grave to block Donald <laughs> Trump. Scalia, a great justice, but there's not a federalism problem here. It's true the federal government can't make state governments do things, but for decades they've withheld money when they didn't, and that's been upheld by the Supreme Court. But didn't Medicaid, ex the whole Medicaid expansion ruling with ACA that addressed exactly. that in that they said that states now had to decide state case by case. And if you remember, the feds were threatening to withhold Medicaid money from states that didn't expand. And the court ruled you can't do that. Logistically. Because that's holding a gun to their head. Logistically, Mark, how can, if, let's say it's a traffic stop, which is a criminal offense, how are cities going to be able to, some cities especially, going to be able to say, if I f find an undocumented immigrant after he, he or she ran a red light, 
I've got to bring them in. I mean, where are they going to put them? I mean, right. where's the, I mean, logistically, is this going to work? A lot of it, I think, is is based on notification. It's not necessarily that they're going to handle the situation themselves. You know, take the undocumented immigrant in, uh, but may, you know, I guess maybe the question is, do you notify the federal authorities that this person is undocumented well, and let the, that process and go? The federal through. authorities may have reason to want that particular person. Most of the traffic stops would be somebody they wouldn't care about. But putting ICE on notice that you ha we have somebody here detained gives the ICE the option to come and take them if they've got some other federal issue that puts them at risk of endangering the United States. One of the reasons why some cities are doing this, they're saying it's not an ideological issue, it's a it's an economic issue because of just what you brought up. They, a, a traffic stop, somebody they normally just ticket and send on their way, now they're hauling them in and having to lock them up and put them in de some kind of detention awaiting an ICE response. They'd have to pay for it. It's unclear who would pay for that, who would have to, and what if it turned out to be wrong? Who, who's going to foot the bill for suspected? They, they, are, they are undocumented yeah. immigrants. They shouldn't be here. They're yeah. breaking the law. Right. So shouldn't local governments bear some responsibility of enforcing federal law? Well, but you, you, but you have to understand the reason why these sanctuary cities occurred. What the police in those major cities, New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Boston, lots of others say is that when an, when an undocumented person sees a crime being committed, oftentimes they're fearful of cooperating with the police and saying what they know for fear that they will be deported. So unless they're otherwise engaged in some criminal activity, uh, the local governments often say we just as soon have their cooperation in working with the police. May I say a word about another immigration policy that uh, Trump... Uh, the refugee issue? Uh, yeah, I was going to talk about the extreme vetting. Uh, are well, we going to do yeah, that? Yeah, to get to that, because it does affect Columbus and Central Ohio, the uh, Somalian uh, population in particular. Uh, he's basically putting a moratorium for 30 days. He wants to put a moratorium for 30 days on refugees from Iran, Iraq, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, Syria, and Yemen. Yeah. Um, it's basically... This is the extreme vetting. These are Muslim, predominantly Muslim countries. It's not a Muslim ban. It's a ban on these countries. So, so here's what I was going to say about it. Extreme vetting sounds good and reasonable until you realize that it's already occurring. Right now, refugees are so intensely screened that it takes 18 to 24 months before they are settled in this country. They go through Homeland Security, the FBI, the State Department, the UN High commission and so forth. And the proof is in the pudding. Since 9-11, we have admitted 785,000 refugees to this country. Not one has ever been involved in a terrorist act. And out of that 785,000, 12 have been arrested or removed later for terrorist concerns. That's one one thousandth of one percent. You can't get any better yeah, than when that. When you have a big terrorist event, you wish you had done something sooner. And Western Europe is finding that out now. And so we're seeing very different process being the canary in the in the mine. Mm -hmm. We know that when we don't know who's coming over, that the terrorists have essentially admitted that they will hide amongst the refugees and be here. We have a right as a country to make sure that who's coming here are people who do not put our put our citizens at risk. But why not Saudi Arabia, where most of the 9/11 hijackers came from, and why not Afghanistan, where the 9/11 plot was hatched. My guess is if you added those countries, Dale wouldn't support it anyway, and so liberals won't be in favor of this no matter <laughs> know, what. No, but they're do. not on the list. And every executive branch has to make policy choices, but the notion that it's unconstitutional forgets two points. One is people from other countries don't have American constitutional rights, and two, you can treat people differently as long as there's a compelling government interest, and uh, avoiding terrorism is certainly a compelling Well, nobody interest. is talking about constitutional rights here, Mark. What I'm well, talking about is 785,000 refugees admitted since 9-11 and zero zero yeah. involved in terrorist well, acts. Now, kids. that I tells mean, me we're doing something bombing. right, wouldn't you say? But, but how, I mean, but, but that's true of anyone who gives, gives birth to a child who ends up yeah. blowing up a bunch of we kids in a high school. Take steps that's to those people. Remember, what we're doing here is we're relitigating the election. These arguments were made <laughs> prior to the election, and the voters chose Donald Trump, and the people opposed to Donald Trump are relitigating the issues as if this is a new discussion. But you can still argue the issues. Oh, though. you're welcome yeah. to, yeah. but it's a relitigation yeah, and, and, and let me just say one other thing, Mark. By doing this thing where we exclude Christians from the ban from these countries, which is what he's doing, we are singling out Muslims, which is going to hurt our national security in two ways. Number one, it's going to give ISIS and the radicals a propaganda talking point. And second, it's going to alienate Muslim citizens here in this yeah. country on whose tips Hillary and intelligence police rely to catch terrorist disagreed. plots. Let's get to Obama another campaign promise. President, President Trump made good on another campaign promise this week when he withdrew 
the U.S. from the largest regional trade pact in history, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Some businesses insist the TPP would have benefited Ohio's farm, chemical, steel, and auto industries, while others argue the trade deal would send even more Ohio jobs overseas. Now the president is promising to renegotiate NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement with Mexico and Canada. And Fisher, was TPP, was TPP good or bad for Ohio? Will we benefit from pulling out or suffer because of it? It depends on who you are and what you represent. I mean, I had two different organizations representing farmers uh, on the show this week, and they both came from different points of view. So it, it just kind of depends. But I will say, you mentioned the chemical industry. Ohio's chemical industry shipped $254 million in product uh, uh, to TPP countries last year, but faced tariffs of up to 35%, right? 97.2% percent of those tariffs would have been duty free under TPP. So that's a flat out, you know, it, that's a bottom line issue. But, you know, there are other issues as well. And uh, some of the things, you know, that, that organizations, um, for instance, the AFL-CIO or the Ohio Farmers Union mentioned were human rights issues, uh, environmental issues. Donald Trump, by putting the kibosh on T TPP, has, as far as I know, has not said a word about how he would negotiate those issues going forward in what he calls, you know, the bilateral agreements that he tends to favor. But you know, some of the manufacturers have said TPP would have hurt like car manufacturers because the auto parts mark. There were lower standards on how many auto parts could be imported from Mexico or Asian countries to be manufactured at the Marysville Honda plant, for instance. Right. Although there's also concern that if you scrap NAFTA or renegotiate NAFTA, you could really hurt the auto industry too because since NAFTA was put in place, it sort of created a pipeline of parts uh, distribution suppliers you know, between the countries that affect uh, uh, U.S. And, and Ohio jobs in particular. And, um, if you look at Ohio's exporting markets, Canada's number one and Mexico's number two in terms of Ohio products. And uh, I think really the, the, the question is going to be, you know, which lobby ha has the most say in this? Because uh, Anne is right. I mean, it, different groups are affected differently. And, you know, one of the groups that doesn't get talked a lot about a lot when it comes to these kind of trade arguments is agriculture farmers, because a lot of these export deals really help uh, produce markets for American farmers, soybeans in particular. And a big market in Japan. Japan really wants to start tapping the American market, but it can't without an agreement like TPP. This is an odd, this, this was an agreement between Hillary Clinton, adopted agreement, and Donald Trump. They both want to do, a T, do away with TPP. Dale, Democrats generally are in favor of doing away with this trade yeah. deal. And Mark, Republicans generally like trade deals, but here you have a Republican president who wants to do away with them. I'll start with you, Mark. Where, do we, where does, quote, establishment, chamber of commerce, business group, Republicans, sure. how do they view this? It's fascinating. I'm more of a free trader than a fair trader, uh, but Donald Trump's the president. And I think we will look back on this month of 2017 where labor leaders left the White House and praised President Donald Trump for doing this. And that's a coalition that had been a traditional Democrat constituency for most of my life. If this continues to be the case where he puts populism over a party, he's going to have such an interesting base that he may very well be able to be reelected in 2020. I don't think there's any question that TPP and a renegotiation, renegotiation of NAFTA would be popular here in the state of Ohio. But there's a trade policy that Trump announced this week that won't be very popular here in the state of Ohio. And I'm talking about the 20 percent tariff or tax that he plans to put on Mexican imports coming in to pay for this ridiculous border wall, okay? Now, that tax is going to be paid not by Mexico, but by American consumers who will pay higher prices for everything they buy from Mexico, from cars to beer to winter vegetables and fruits. And who is going to suffer most from that tax? Why, it's the, it's the working class folks who shop a lot at places like Walmart and who voted for Trump because they foolishly thought that he'd look after their interests. So the Mexican economy would be hurt even worse than, than Ohioans in a, because of they were many of, I think we're the, they're lo, by far their largest trading partner. I think 80% of their exports come to the United States, Mark. So they, the 20% tax or tariff, whatever you want to call it, would hurt them as well. Right, but as Dale mentions, that cost is going to be borne by somebody, and it's not going to be necessarily the Mexican government the way Donald Trump is suggesting. It would probably be passed along at some point in the chain, even to consumers. And really, one of the interesting things I think that's going to be uh, worth following with this whole debate is I think the expectation is that, you know, Donald Trump wanting to renegotiate these deals or scrap them all together, you know, stems from an idea that they've really hurt manufacturing in states like Ohio, Michigan, 
uh, Pennsylvania, sort of the, the former blue yeah. wall. And there's there's real question and, and you know uncertainty be, uncertainty about how much can be done to help manufacturing through trade deals. You know, on the flip side, there's questions about how much manufacturing has been hurt by a trade deal versus automation, automation. or increased productivity that's you know dropped down manufacturing jobs. So, you know, I think the intent is to help manufacturing. We'll see if this actually does it. And then there's another issue as well. One of the overarching ideas of Donald Trump is to stop illegal immigration, stop illegal movement across the border. When you do the damage that something like a 20% tariff would do to Mexico's economy, when you do damage like that, you're forcing more people across the border. You're not stopping it. The best thing the United States can do in a lot of people's minds is make Mexico flourish uh, in and of itself. But Mark, Mark, let me get to Mark. Get but, you know, these trade, there has been a decline in manufacturing for whatever reason over the past, since NAFTA went into, a, into effect, and Ross Perot with his giant sucking sound is, was partially correct. What is the correct adjustment, in your mind, to NAFTA, TPP, and these trade deals to try to get the maximum benefit for the middle class in the United States? Well, I, I say this. One thing Donald Trump does have to do is make a deal. There's a lot of things he does that are very different than other presidents. He's found a way to bring people to the table and get things done in business, I think he'll do that in government. And it'll be a sloppy process, but you have to find a way to protect American interests while not having uh, foreign interests create the problem that Dale was talked about. I'm just kind of happy that Dale has acknowledged the point I made on this show for years, which is every corporate tax is a consumer tax. And so when you want to raise corporate taxes, Dale, remember the working class people will the ones pay it. Well, right. Except it's not a tax on corporations. This is a tax on goods. But let me just well, say well, something. We gotta get, we gotta get to other stuff. Let me get to let me get to this other stuff because there's, right. there's, there's plenty to talk about. All right. uh, we just keep relitigating re this uh, election and through uh, policies during the campaign. Donald Trump openly speculated the election could be rigged and then he won, and he's still saying it's rigged because he did not win the popular vote. Trump told business leaders he lost that vote because of quote massive voter fraud. Experts agree there was no widespread voter fraud in the election, yet Trump promises an investigation. Here in Ohio, Secretary of State John Husted says there was virtually no fraud, and he worries about the president's statements. It, it does concern me, and I've, and I've said this in the past. When, when the president talked about the election um, being rigged during the election, that's when I came out and I, and I publicly said, look, there's, there's no evidence of that. This is a bipartisan process in Ohio. Uh, I know that it's a bipartisan process in other states, and we have, and the system of elections in America is as good as it's ever been. Dale Butlin, you agree with John Houston, I take it. Yeah. yeah, so look, let's be clear what this is all about. Donald Trump's raging ego has never let him accept the fact that three million more people voted for Hillary Clinton, nearly three million more voted for her than voted for him. So to salve his insecurity, he has concocted this preposterous conspiracy conspiracy theory that the only reason he lost the popular vote was because three to five illegal voters voted in this past election. But think about that for a minute. Not only is there not one shred of evidence, as you just heard Secretary Houston say, there's no election official in the country that supported it. There's no study that backs it either. It also is contradicted by Trump's own campaign, who when they were trying to shut down recounts in states like Michigan and Wisconsin filed a court brief that said, and I quote, all available evidence suggests that the 2016 election was not tainted by fraud or mistake. So when Trump was trying to shut down a recount, he said there was no fraud. When he's trying to explain why he lost the popular vote, there was massive fraud. Is this just overreacting, Mark, to somebody shooting from the hip? I mean, granted, Trump has a huge ego. He hates to come in second or not have the highest ratings or the biggest crowds or the most votes. I mean, are we really, we're not going to really have a huge investigation. We're not going to find anything wrong here. Imagine that, a politician with an ego. <laughs> um, listen, John Houston's right about this. There's no evidence of widespread voter fraud. There's lots of voter fraud, and every case of it is a civil rights violation that should be dealt with harshly, which the Obama administration did not do. But John, in addition to saying that, John said that there were zero examples of voter suppression in Ohio. And in fact, in the last 30 years, there have been zero prosecutions for voter suppression, although the Democrats like to claim there's voter suppression. So here's what we know. There's not massive voting fraud. Trump's wrong about that. There's not any voter suppression. The Democrats are wrong about that. And Russia did not change the outcome of this election. And so we can take all of that nonsense, toss it out, move ahead and make changes on American policy. Nobody said place. Russia changed 
change oh, the outcome. Oh, lots of liberals have what said that. What they said was is that Russian that. tried to tried to influence it and tried to help Trump and hurt Hillary. Oh, that's, no, no, the that's, people who said the last the part were Obama said. administration political but, appointees. But look, but, but, but Russia has been meddling in American politics as long as all of us have been alive, and that's what spies do. It's wrong, it's just not new. Back to Mike's point, though, Mike. You said, well, there isn't going to be a big investigation. Trump says there is. He says there will be a massive investigation. Now, one of it's only that only means one of two things. One, he's going to waste millions of taxpayers' uh, dollars to investigate something that's not there, or he wants to use this as an excuse for the GOP to pass more laws in more states, making it harder for poor people and minorities to vote. And by the way, no you laws. say there's no suppression, no but the courts disagree with no, no, you. John Houston, the guy you disagreed with, the courts he, he disagree with you. That. The court struck and him down five what's times. The U.S. Supreme what's, Court has, has upheld voter ID uh, in Indiana. Let's move from case. opinion to al alternative facts, as they have, are now known <laughs> as. Um, and what, what do you mean? This is the whole thing here. Is what is these two folks have opinions and they can look at different s stories and see different things. But then there are other things that are clear. And we saw that with the, the inauguration crowd count uh, from last week and the right. kerfuffle over that. How are journalists, media, talk show hosts supposed to deal with this? Well, I, I think that Kelly McBride from the Pointer Institute made a good, di good distinction this week on the program, saying that uh, when you use the word lie, you're assuming you, under, you know the intent. So I, could, I make mistakes all the time on the program, you know, because I get my facts wrong or whatever. It's not on purpose, heaven knows. Uh, I try to correct myself as as soon as possible, but it's not a lie, and that's the question, and that that's where you know an ethicist, a you know journalistic ethicist, that's where she draws the line and recommends we how we refer to it really does matter. Mark, what's the media's role in pointing out these things? I mean, not using the word lie, but we should say this is false, provably false. We've heard all these terms over the past week. Right, and I think you're seeing that already. In fact, you started started seeing happening before the election where sort of in reaction to things that a lot of what Donald Trump was saying that was demonstrably false or could be proven to be false, you started to see that creeping right into the copy where there would be something reported about what Donald Trump said and then a statement saying this yep. is wrong or the evidence doesn't support it or whatnot. Uh, like Ann says, I think the trickier um, piece of this is how do you characterize it? When you go as far as to say this is a demonstrably a lie or you know, in, in injecting some kind of motive there, um, and, and really, you know, I think what a lot of people are going to be watching for is how does the, the press shop of uh, the uh, Trump administration continue? I mean, if, if, if there's a credibility issue, and, and I think there was from the start where Sean Spicer's first press conference, uh, first press briefing yeah. from the podium was all about this crowd size yeah. and, you know, this is the most watched inauguration ever, which it wasn't. And, you know, if, if it really does, you know, undermine the credibility or create questions in the credibility of, of sort of the official communication from the White House, it's going to be a problem when it comes to a matter like, you know, a, a foreign problem yeah. or a military situation. I just want to make sure that the press are holding presidents accountable equally. This is, he said some wrong things, no doubt about it. But when Barack Obama in 2011 said that the fence on the border with Mexico was nearly complete, when it was 5% complete, that's not opinion, that's not a prediction, it's provably false. There was no media outrage about it because it didn't advance the, the narrative that they were accustomed to advancing. So let's hold people accountable, but politicians of both parties have been misleading voters for years, and I'm all for the press holding them accountable. Dale, you spoke for politicians before. Where, where's the line where you, you, want to you want to advocate for a position and you select facts that help you advocate for that position, but where's the line as a spokesperson? that you shouldn't cross. Yeah, so uh, I've actually trained other people, too, to be press secretaries, and the first rule that I always tell them is, your first rule is never lie. Now, you can spin, you can try to change the subject, you can say, I'll get back to you, you can try to put the best possible face on the facts, but you cannot lie, because when you get caught in your first lie, you have lost credibility and your usefulness to the person you're working for is over. Mark, what is your take on that? I mean, you're, the same, you're in the same business. You, you sign facts that support your candidate, your cause's uh, goals. How, how, up, how far up against that line can you go? Politicians and spokespeople should not lie. Their credibility matters. The government is working for us. They're doing our work, and so we need to hold them accountable. My only point is I hope the media will hold everybody equally accountable and also point out that opponents 
often, or pl voters often accuse their political opponents of lying. It's become a common tactic. But is, is part of this because of Trump's open hostility to the media, which Barack Obama did not yes. have and George W. Bush did yes. not have? His top advisor saying, shut your mouth. Shut your, shut your mouth and listen, but that was a stupid thing to say. Yeah. Remember, Obama's joke at the Correspondents' Dinner a couple years ago was that the press was his base, and everybody laughed because it's true, and I think that's part of it. It's Donald Trump is fighting okay. with the media. We've got to get to our off-the-record comments. John McCain we'll, who said that, not uh, no, Barack Obama. Obama said it as well. <laughs> well, we'll start with Mark Weaver with our off-the-record comment. Um, I think that Josh Mandel will have a straight shot at the primary for U.S. Senate. Some people thought he might have opponents in the primary. I will predict here that he will be our Republican nominee for Senate here in two years. <clears throat> Before we shrug and accept Donald Trump's Syria line as the, as the new normal, I hope we'll reflect on the words of Vaclav Havel, who was a prominent Czech dissident, later became president of the country. He said, when leaders lie about clearly disprovable things, the message it sends to the rest of us is that lying is okay and facts don't matter. Whether we're Democrats, Republicans, or Independents, we should expect more out of the president of the United States. Mark, real quick, a minute left. Uh, one of the big developments after Kellyanne Conway went on the news shows uh, and talked about alternative facts is it, it created a big rush to go read uh, 1984 from George Orwell. And it's not sold out on Amazon, I understand. Yes. Ann. Uh, I'm not selling my copy to anybody. Um, as far as being done litigating, uh, the point you made earlier, Mark, I think we've only just begun. If you want to put it in terms of litigating, go ahead. But we have four years ahead, at least in one term, uh, to talk about. We've always had a lot to talk about. And I hope we continue to talk about everything that happens in public policy at the federal, the state, and the local level. And, and if we stop litigating, what are we going to do on a Friday afternoon? Exactly. Or Friday it's our full on, it's Or our Sunday full afternoon or whatever. Right. Anyway, that is Columbus on the Record for this week. Check us out online. Continue the discussion on Facebook, Twitter, and our website, WOSU.org. For our crew and for our panel, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.